It's a lonely planet, the only one within trillions of miles on which we can live. It feeds us, lets us breathe, and protects us from harmful radiation. But as living standards around the world have risen, the environment has suffered. Industry, agriculture, and transport are significant contributors to atmospheric pollution. 90% of global trade is carried by sea. With vessels using one-tenth of the fuel required per tonne for road transport and one-hundredth required by air transport, how else could goods and commodities move cheaply around the world? Today's vessels are twice as energy efficient as those of 20 years ago. But shipping is still responsible for some of the airborne oxides of nitrogen, bringing smog and respiratory disease, and sulfur dioxide causing acid rain. It is also responsible for some of the ozone depleting gases contributing to increasing rates of skin cancer. The effects of airborne pollution are greatest where marine traffic passes close to urban areas. Emissions are already limited by MARPOL regulations, but now new tighter limits have been set by MARPOL Annex 6. MARPOL Annex 6 applies to all vessels, drilling rigs and other platforms. And certification is mandatory on all vessels trading internationally. It is designed to limit air pollution in many different ways. There are strict limits on emissions of oxides of nitrogen and sulphur from engines. And clear rules about demonstrating compliance. Marine diesels must be certified to meet these standards over their entire life. Annex 6 also affects engine modifications and imposes restrictions on how engine maintenance is undertaken. It identifies how gases used in refrigeration and firefighting systems must be disposed of. It sets tight controls on shipboard incinerators and what materials can be disposed of. It standardizes vapor recovery systems where their use is mandatory. And it standardizes vapor emission control manifolds and connections and provides procedural guidelines on their use. To meet MARPOL Annex 6, all vessels over 400 gross tons involved in international trade must be surveyed under the authority of their flag state. Vessels must have an International Air Pollution Prevention or IAPP certificate or an equivalent. This must be renewed every five years with regular inspections to ensure equipment is maintained and operating procedures are correct. In addition to the flag state certification, regular port state inspections check that these standards are maintained. There are specific regulations covering each type of pollution and their source. Oxides of nitrogen are damaging to our health, causing smog, lung damage and respiratory disease. They are also greenhouse gases, 
and so contribute to global warming. To reduce emissions from vessels built between 1990 and 2000, NOx standards are applicable to engines of more than 5,000 kilowatts and a 90-litre displacement if an upgrade kit is available. Since January 2000, all vessels have been issued with an Engine International Air Pollution Prevention or EIAPP certificate by the flag state. This details tests carried out at the engine builder's works. Annex 6 NOx controls apply to every marine diesel engine of more than 130 kilowatts on vessels whose keel was laid after this date. Only engines used wholly for emergencies are exempt. The regulations also apply where engines have been substantially modified after January 2000. For example, where a replacement engine has been fitted or the power output increased by 10% or more. Equally, where changing engine components or settings has increased NOx emissions, the regulations would apply. It is the responsibility of the ship owner to prove that any changes do not increase the emissions of oxides of nitrogen. Combustion temperature is the key to NOx emissions. At temperatures over 1600 degrees Celsius, NOx emissions rise dramatically. Lowering the temperature reduces emissions, but increases fuel consumption. The NOx emissions limits for marine diesel engines are related to their rated crankshaft speed. For example, at a maximum permitted duty cycle of 130 rpm or less, NOx is limited to 17 grams per kilowatt hour. There is a direct relationship between the rated crankshaft speed and NOx emissions limits. For example, a 1000 RPM rated engine would be limited to 11.3 grams per kilowatt hour. At 2000 RPM and above, the limit is set at 9.8 grams per kilowatt hour. New engines must meet the NOx limits of the three-tier structure. Tier 1 reflects existing technology. Engines of more than 130 kilowatts on vessels built before 2011 are limited to 17 grams per kilowatt hour at less than 130 rpm. Tier 2 represents newer technologies with emissions reduced by up to 25%. It relates to two types of vessels. The first are those constructed between 2011 and 2015 with engines of more than 130 kilowatts. The second are those built after the 1st of January 2016 and operating outside of designated waters known as emission control areas, now called ECAs. Tier 2 sets limits of 14.4 grams per kilowatt hour for engines rated at less than 130 rpm. Designation for NOx controls in ECAs is an evolving picture, however. It is important to check with the flag state which ECAs impose controls. Tier 3 represents future technologies and applies to engines installed on vessels after the 1st of January 2016, which operate within ECAs. It sets limits of 3.4 grams per kilowatt hour at less than 130 RPM. The Tier 1, 2 
and three NOx emissions limits for diesel engines rated at speeds of 130 rpm and greater are set out in the supporting workbook. All NOx emissions information for each engine must be included in the NOx technical file and must be approved by the vessel's current flag state. This document must identify the engine type and model, its serial number, rated power and speed, together with the duty cycle for which it is approved. It must specify the allowable NOx critical component options and permitted settings such as fuel pump timing. It must detail the onboard NOx verification procedure relevant to the particular engine. There must also be a copy of the emissions test report used to certify the engine and the EIAPP certificate. If applicable, there should also be a copy of the designations and restrictions for that particular engine group. For example, maximum charge or scavenge air temperature under reference conditions. This technical file must be kept on board. It must be original, maintained up to date, contain no unauthorized amendments and be available for inspection. Finally, for each engine, a record book of engine parameters must be maintained by the vessel's staff. This must record all changes to the engine, including parameter settings and replacement components that may influence NOx emission levels. Sulphur is a source of particulate matter which causes lung damage. It is also a major cause of acid rain which damages buildings, destroys forests and increases the acidity of the sea. Annex 6 controls emissions of oxides of sulphur by limiting the sulphur content of all marine fuel oils, irrespective of their use. The limits were set at 4.5% until the 1st of January 2012, 3.5% from the 1st of January 2012, and at 0.5% on the 1st of January 2020. Annex 6 sets limits on sulphur in fuels used in emission control areas. These restrict sulphur content to 1.5% prior to the 1st of July 2010, 1% between 2010 and 2015 and 0.1% after 2015. Emission control areas for oxides of sulphur include the Baltic Sea and the North Sea with the United States and Canada from 2011. Since 2007, the sulphur limit in fuels has been set at 0.5% within 24 miles of the Californian coast. This raises the issue of which fuel to load for any voyage. For vessels that do not enter or operate wholly within an ECA, it is easy to load the fuel oils with the correct sulphur content. For vessels moving between restricted and unrestricted waters, there is a difficult choice to be made. Either burn only low sulphur fuel, but at higher cost, or install segregated bunker capacity and switch between high and low sulphur fuels. Managing such a changeover is not simple. It is vital to complete the changeover fully before entering an ECA. Otherwise, a ship will be in breach of Annex 6. Changing between high and low sulphur bunkers may have an impact on fuel stability and engine lubrication requirements. In some cases, a vessel may need duplicate fuel service tank systems 
and two grades of cylinder lube. The oil record book must record the date, time and position when changeover of fuel was completed prior to entry and on commencing changeover after exit. Records must be accurate and complete. The amount of low sulphur fuel must be recorded before entering and after leaving the ECA. These amounts must correspond with the take-up of bunkers entered into the oil record book. The chief engineer must ensure that the correct grades of fuel have been loaded and only from suppliers registered with the authorities in each country where they operate. A bunker delivery note is required for each delivery and must contain the name and IMO number of the receiving ship, the date of supply, the port, the quantity, the density at 15 degrees Celsius, the sulphur content and the name and address of the supplier. There must also be a signed declaration by the supplier's representative that the fuel oil conforms to the Annex 6 regulation. These documents must be kept on board and available for inspection for three years from the date of supply. The bunker supplier must provide a sealed sample taken in accordance with IMO guidelines. This must be kept on board until the fuel is consumed but for no less than a year. This sample must not be confused with the commercial sample for fuel testing purposes and must never be used in place of those samples. If different fuel grades are used, there must be a written procedure that ensures there is sufficient time for fuels in the system to be completely changed before entering an ECA. Alternatively, Annex 6 permits an approved exhaust gas cleaning system, or EGCS, to be fitted. This must limit total sulphur dioxide emissions to 6 grams per kilowatt hour. Waste incineration is another source of pollution. Annex 6 limits wastes that may be incinerated and provides guidance on which materials may contain harmful chemicals. For instance, PCBs, waste containing heavy metals, refined petroleum products containing halogen compounds and residues of cargo oil are all banned. PVCs may only be incinerated in IMO type approved incinerators. While sewage sludge and sludge oil may be incinerated outside ports and estuaries, this is limited to sludge generated on board. Combustion chamber gas outlet temperatures must be monitored at all times. Waste must not be fed into a continuous feed incinerator when the temperature is below the minimum allowed 850 degrees Celsius. The combustion chamber gas outlet temperature of a batch loaded incinerator should reach 600 degrees Celsius within five minutes of startup and then stabilize at not less than 850 degrees Celsius. Operators must receive training in incinerator use. This training must be recorded and there must be an operational manual on board. For many tankers' safety, it is inevitable that some volatile organic compounds or VOCs are vented during a passage. However, during discharging and loading, large volumes of these gases are often vented when they could be captured. Volatile organic compounds contain powerful greenhouse gases such as methane. 
They also combine with oxides of nitrogen and sulfur to create ground level ozone and smog. Annex 6 allows countries to require that tankers operating within their jurisdiction are fitted with vapour collection systems so that connection can be made with the vapour emission control of their terminals. Crude oil tankers must have an approved VOC management plan which includes procedures for minimising VOC emissions during cargo loading, discharging, tank washing and while in transit. The plan must be supported by a training program that ensures best management practices are followed. It must take into account any VOC reduction devices fitted to the vessel. In particular, the plan should aim to minimize gas release due to low pressure and high velocity flows and from partial filling of tanks. Loading and discharge sequences should be planned to minimize the time taken filling or emptying tanks. A target pressure for tanks should be identified and this should be as high as safely possible. Use of added inert gas should be minimized. Crude oil washing should be kept to a minimum and closed cycle washing used wherever possible. The plan must identify a person responsible for implementation who is experienced in these operations on that vessel. Ozone is the planet's natural protection from harmful radiation. Its depletion is linked to increasing rates of skin cancer. Annex 6 prohibits deliberate venting of ozone depleting substances or ODS such as the freons and halons often found in air conditioning, refrigeration and firefighting systems. When servicing, renewing or decommissioning equipment containing ozone depleting substances there must be no emissions of these gases to the atmosphere. Annex 6 allows the installation of hydrofluorocarbon or HCFC based systems until 2020. However, several US states have already banned their use. Vessels over 400 gross tons must maintain a list of equipment containing ozone depleting substances. If there are rechargeable systems on board, the vessel must maintain an ODS record book. This must contain a record of all maintenance, disposal and recharging. Records of the mass of any ODS involved must be entered without delay. MARPOL Annex 6 sets the standards by which all vessels must operate. Its phased approach is tightening controls on emissions year by year. And it has the force of law. Any vessel over 400 gross tons and its responsible officers can be detained for absence of documentation such as an EIAPP certificate or technical files. An engine installed or substantially modified after 2000 that does not comply with the nitrous oxide limits. Non-compliance with SOX limits within an ECA. Having a non-compliant incinerator on board. Officers or crew lacking proper knowledge of or training on the equipment involved in emission control or inaccurate record keeping. The solution lies in familiarity with the regulations, training and attention to detail in procedures and record keeping. Today, 
Marpol Annex 6 is helping to reduce the damage we are inflicting on our planet by slowing ozone depletion, by reducing gases harmful to our health, and by reducing acid rain. But Marpol Annex 6 can only be effective if every one of us plays our part in reducing emissions. And then maybe we will be able to pass on to our children a planet on which they can live. After all, it's the only one we've got.